Welcome to the Rocky Mountain AI Interest Group's YouTube channel. Our September meeting was entitled AI and Robotics. The following presentation was made by Jacob Korniak and Morgan Bell of Furhat Robotics. See our YouTube channel for other presentations made at the meeting and the full recording. For more information, see our meetup page, our website, and our YouTube channel. Our first speaker, our first speakers are from Furhat Robotics. Uh, Jacob and Morgan are, are joining us. Uh, Jacob's an AI enthusiast with a passion for emerging tech. He has a background in software sales, and he currently works as a business development representative uh, and university research liaison for Furhat and Misty Robotics. When not at work, Jacob enjoys backcountry skiing and climbing in the flat irons. And Jacob and I are gonna lead an AI ski day up at Brainerd Lake this winter if anyone's into backcountry or cross-country skiing. Uh, Morgan Bell is a technology veteran. He's the head of engineering at Furhat. Uh, he has over 20 years of industry experience spanning everything from IoT and robotics to desktop software and enterprise SaaS. He leads the engineering and product teams at Furhat and previously led the engineering team at Misty Robotics. When he's not working on product strategy or coding, he spends his time with his wife and three kids, gaming or enjoying the outdoors. So please join me in welcoming Jacob and Morgan. Hello. Thank you, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Jacob Korniak with Ferrat Robotics. Uh, it's really nice to see everybody today. Uh, I was here a few months ago, it feels like now. Um, and so much has changed, right, in the past few months. So really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining. Okay, so when we think about the robotic revolution, um, I think most of us maybe would have thought it would have been happening by now, right? Uh, Self-aware robots becoming our overlords, making us work in the tungsten mines, right? That, that's what I think when I think of uh, the robotic revolution. And the reality is, is obviously that hasn't happened yet. We're still all here in person, I believe, uh, watching and, and, and learning about robotics and AI. So it hasn't happened yet. But the reality is, is that the robot revolution is already happening and it's been happening for decades. Um, but maybe a little less bloody and dramatic as we may think. Um, for a long time, we've thought uh, about where these robots fit into our society, what their role is, uh, how they're portrayed in media, what they do, what are the ethics of them, what are the limitations, what are the strengths? And I think so many times we think about how robots are applied today. You know, your car was made by a robot. All the electronics in your hands were made by robots. Um, most of our modern technologies and convenience today are thanks to robots. But the reality is that engineers uh, face the same problems today as they did 50 years ago when we think about these robotic systems. I think when I, when I was thinking about this meeting today, you know, again, as, as Dan mentioned, we're really high level on, on really what we think um, on the AI side. So I wanted to take a step back and say, you know, what is a robot? Um, and so at a high level, a robot is a machine that is designed to accomplish a task. But you might be thinking now, Jacob, that's great, but is my calculator a robot? And the, and the reality is what robots really are in our society are machines that use their programming to make decisions. If there is a coin uh, that falls on the ground, right? And I would like to pick up this coin. I need to go through three major and high level uh, processes to pick up this coin. The first, my eyes need to see the coin that's on the ground. Uh, and communicate sensory issues up to my brain, where the coin is sitting, how it's reflected in the light, how, how, what the depth of that coin is, how it's sitting. Is it, is it, is it up flat? Is it, is it down on its side? Next, I need to send that sensory information to my brain, and my brain needs to make a decision, the decision to, I need to go pick up this coin. Finally, my brain uses that decision, uses the sensory information, comes down, uh, and, and sends the signals to my muscles to pick up the coin. Now, this may seem like a very simple process to us humans, but the reality is there's so much going on uh, when we think about robotics. The robots need to have sensors. They need to understand where, what, what, what are we talking about? What are the data of this, of, this, of this coin on the ground? What am I looking at? How, again, how is it sitting? What are the edges like? It needs to have control systems uh, to make these decisions, to process, process all of those sensory data and make those decisions. And finally, it needs to have end, of, end effectors um, things that actually go and pick up the coin. And, and as you may, may imagine, there's so much that can go wrong with that, um, whether that's on the sensor side, 
the control system side or the end effector side. Um, today, when I was driving here and getting changed for this event, I looked out, it was 60 degrees and cloudy. Uh, so I put on a sweater and, and nice comfy clothes. And all of a sudden here I am walking uh, into the Atlas Institute sweating, right? And so my control systems made a decision uh, based on my past experience of what 60 degrees and cloudy feels like. Uh, but the reality is, is you're not always right. And that's the problem with robotics. Uh, that again, the engineers are still facing those problems today. Now, when we think about the history of robotics, um, industry is really where robot systems were born. Picking up and moving he medi, uh, really heavy metal objects um, is, is what they're kind of good at, right? So the first major robot uh, and what's considered the first one was uh, the Unimate robot, which is a, a GM production line welding robot uh, that was put into place in New Jersey in 1961. Super basic. Um, it weighed, I think, two tons. It was massive. Um, it made very, very small and calculated, um, um, you know, it's welding, um, wel welding interactions. And, and, and now today we fast forward all sorts of uh, systems later and, and they're making our cars. And obviously a lot happened in between here. Um, but, but these robots are in the world today. They're making our cars, they're making our electronics. They're using all those three sensories data and all those control systems to, to do these tasks. The next set of robotics we think about um, are humanoid robots or social robots. Robots that are designed to look and act like humans or and or robots that are designed to interact with humans on a social scale. So the first one we think about here is the Wabot robot, which is uh, created at a Japanese re uh, University Research Institute in 1973. Um, it was extremely advanced at the time. Uh, maybe today we wouldn't think so, but at the time it was a big breakthrough. It could take a whole step every about 60 seconds. Uh, it could pick up uh, very, very small soda cans. It had to be programmed to a high degree. Um, it could do a lot, but what we learned from the Wabot robot is that it could do a lot, but not very well. Um, it could do everything, but it had to be programmed. It was extremely manual. Move forward to the Kismet robot, which was at MIT in 1990. That was really considered the first social robot. Um, and we kind of used, we kind of thought what we learned from the humanoid side of saying, hey, let's just, instead of having one humanoid robot that kind of does everything okay, how about we have one robot that's focused on one area? And that's where social robotics came from, or robots that are designed on the conversational speed, uh, side. So the Kismet robot uh, could talk, uh, it could lip sync very barbarically, um, it could blink, it could express some level of emotion uh, with, its, with its eyebrows. From there, we fast forward um, on the humanoid side over to something like the Atlas robot uh, with Boston Dynam Dynamics, which maybe you've seen do the flips and cartwheels, uh, or even uh, Sophia, the robot, uh, which is more on the humanoid uh, social robotic side. But the reality is, is that where are these robots, right? We're all in a room today, we've made these big advances over the last couple of years. And I think so many people for so long were thinking about the future, right? This is a, this is a French ad, uh, asking people what they thought the year 2000 would be like in 1895. And so this is what they thought the year 2000 would be like. Robots in our everyday life doing tasks and accomplishing things for us. But that really begs the question, where are these robots? Now, I think we know three things. The first thing is that hardware is hard. Humans at a high level, um, we, are, we, we kind of understand how to interact with each other but we don't fully get that all the way. Um, hardware, it, it's hard to create, it can break easily. Um, and, and if you think about what that last, that last slide showed you was on the actual, um, on the actual the prediction of, of technology, we don't have those hardware things uh, actually affecting our lives. We're very far, we're, we're kind of far away from having a robot butler in your house do your dishes far away from that. But we have a language model that can answer all these amazing things. And so the first thing we know is hardware is hard. The second thing we know is that design interaction is a problem, an opportunity that we have not fully solved yet. We haven't fully decided what these robots should look like. We haven't fully decided on, on how they should interact. And more importantly, the interaction piece is extremely manual. To have a robot actually speak to you is really, really hard. And the third thing is adoption and affordability. Um, just like here today, nobody owns a, ro a social robot for their common use. Uh, because they're extremely expensive. They're not practical on, on, on a large scale. And, and, and adoption is a key piece of that. Now, to start off with the, on the hardware side, as I mentioned, 
we really kind of had a, some people had a perception on what this looked like, right? So if you if you ask people maybe 50 years ago with the dawn of of AI and the dawn of these 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 robotic systems, what we thought we would have, you may be thinking, you know, this is what humans would be interacting with in 2023. This is what our lives would look like. But the reality is, is that most people's robotic interaction, if not almost everyone's robotic interaction, if you don't work in the robotic field, is maybe a Roomba, right? That might be everyone's. If I, I, I typically I love to ask this at conferences, like, what is the first robot you've interacted with? And every time it's a Roomba. If you don't work in the, in the industry, it's a Roomba, or maybe you know it's on, it's on the actual industrial side of things. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as I mentioned, design considerations. Um, you have kind of a scale here, and when you're thinking about what a interaction with a robot should look like, on one end you have a robot that doesn't look like a human, and it's not meant to look like a human. Uh, there was a famous study uh, done in the early 2000s where Honda was creating a humanoid robot. And when they created a large life-size human robot, when that robot would break um, and have problems, people would be angry at the robot, right? It's, it's oh, this human robot. Come on, you got you to work. You got to answer when I say hello. But what they did is they shrunk that robot and then made it look not like a human at all. And the results were that people, oh, it's cute. It's a little pet. Oh, it's okay if he's learning. Right, so so we have two sides of the scale here, right? We have the side that's, hey, it doesn't look like a human. It's not meant to look like a human. It's a robot. This is a Misty robot. Uh, she's about a foot and a half foot tall. Um, and on the other end, though, you have robots that maybe try to be human but miss. And I think I can see everyone's eyes here, like, oh man, that's just weird, right? And and so the answer to this is, you know, what is what is the middle ground when we when we're thinking about a robot that is in our everyday life? That can inter interact with us, and that you know that serves this key purpose. What does that robot look like? What you've experienced here today is something that researchers have been studying uh, for a long time. I know researchers are studying here at the Atlas Institute are looking at this. Uh, it's called the Uncanny Valley effect. And so I'm interested for this. If for the show of hands, these set of faces, you know, least human to most human. I'm, I'm just going to have you raise your hands. Uh, what section you find the most creepy? Okay, so 35 to 40 percent. Do you find that? That group the most creepy. Okay, a few. Uh, so I said 35, 50 to 60 percent. Okay, a little bit more. 65 to 70 percent. A little bit more. 80 to 95 percent. A little bit less. Okay, and then 100 percent is obviously human. Great. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, what was that? Okay. And so, yeah, what you experience here is called the uncanny valley effect, which is a term to describe this relationship between. Uh, the actual human likeness uh, of this being and your affinity towards it, uh, how creepy or likable you find it. And as you see here in, in, in the Uncanny Valley effect, there is a steep drop off, actually, a valley that occurs typically um, between 60 and 80 uh, percent on average. And so when we're thinking about robotic systems, where do we want to be on this? Uh, what do you want to interact with? If you're interacting with the spot, which I would say is a little bit more on the industrial robot side, it's not really meant, even if spot talked, you wouldn't maybe find it creepy. Maybe some people would. Um, but if it's a little bit too spot, you put a face on spot and maybe had, you know, some sort of mesh uh, interaction face, it might, they might break more into the uncanny valley effect because it's trying to be human. So, so that's kind of something that roboticists think about is, is how do we solve this uncanny valley effect? And, and, and a, something that I don't think we've all decided as an industry. You know, everybody takes obviously different uh, approaches to this problem. The next thing we think about uh, when it comes to the problem with the actual robots in our, not in our lives is adoption. And, and, and for our robotics, what we like to think about is the next interface. So we, as we move through the years uh, and think about the, the, the interfaces here, we've gone from computers to obviously, to obviously handheld devices, maybe some VR. But what is that next interface? And we believe that next interface is human, uh, or excuse me, is a, is a social robot. And why do we think this? Well, we think this because for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, we've been um, honing this interface. We, we've, we've understood as a, as, a, as a race how to interact with this. You don't need to be taught how to interact with a human. Um, it's innate. You walk up and you do it. And now, obviously, there's some, uh, there's some, there's some problems there, right? If you've ever been on maybe, maybe a bad date uh, or had a hard conversation with a coworker, uh, th there's, it's not always perfect. Uh, but what we do understand is we know how to have this uh, interaction. So why don't we start building interfaces uh, to think about this interaction and to incorporate this technology? And so that brings us to Fur Hat today. So here, here's just a quick video uh, of one of our. Um, use cases here, which is a hospitality-based setting. 
see if the sound works. Can we turn it to the, thank you. Yeah, I figured we turned it off. This might be loud. I could. Yep, I think that's what we're going to have to do. Uh, hold up here. Okay. Sorry, y'all. Yeah. Today. I would like to check in, please. Great. I can help you with that. Do you have the confirmation email, the QR code with you here? Uh, yes, here it is. Thank you so much, Mr. Anderson. Your room is on the seventh floor with a great view of the city. You are now checked in and the app works to unlock your room. I can see that your reservation includes three other people. Are you here with your family? Uh, absolutely. We are here with our kids. Lovely. We are really happy to have all of you stay with us. Uh, thanks. Uh, where are the elevators? No problem. The elevators are just here, to my left. Oh, and can you recommend any good sushi restaurant around here? Yes. I really like a little place called Osaka, which is about a 10-minute walk away. Here is a map. Or would you prefer me to book you a taxi? No, I like to walk. Fantastic. Can I help you with anything else? No, that's it. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day, Mr. Anderson. I am here to help at all times. Goodbye. Goodbye. Great. So while that interaction is amazing and incredible um, and, and super exciting for roboticists around the world, what you just saw uh, was coded, right? That interaction needed to be created uh, and honed by a coding team or engineering team um, that had to be custom tailored uh, to, to multiple situations, whether it's a hotel receptionist or a gate agent, a gate agent um, or any sort of interaction. And if you think about that actually coding piece, how much actual uh, manual you know, time needs to go into that. You need to think about um, what, what these humans are going to respond, how they're going to respond. Uh, children for a long time have been a very hard piece of robotics, right? You, you put a robot out in a hotel, it's great. And a child walks up and asks what its favorite cloud shape is, right? There's, you can't predict everything that a human may, may say or do. And so it's been a real problem in robotics. And I think it's been one of the hardest pieces for why there's no adoption. Uh, because if you want to put a robot greeting people with the Rocky Mountain Artificial Intelligence Interest Group uh, meeting, uh, pre-language model, you would need to code the entire interaction. Uh, you would need to have every question anyone could answer loaded onto it. It would take a lot of time. Uh, now, which brings us to the, to the AI piece of this, which I know everyone's been, been kind of thinking about is large language models and why they're important. Um, they've completely revolutionized robotics. Um, if G, some things like GPT, um, API calling into these language models, uh, have eliminated the need for coding, um, to, to a high level. Um, and, and made the interaction more seamless and endless. Uh, and on that note, I'd like to introduce uh, my coworker, uh, Morgan, uh, who's been a little bit introduced before this. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah. Easier to do this? Yeah, of course. If I had known that Jacob was a, a good public speaker like this, I would have gone first instead of after him. So uh, we'll make this work the, the best way we can. Um, like Jacob mentioned, the, the large language model thing has actually changed uh, specifically social robotics, which is what we're doing today, uh, in, a, in a pretty profound way. Um, Fur Hat Robotics started as a research project out of KTH University. Um, you can see it here. Um, what we learned at the time really was that we didn't have good tools to do research into social robots, right? No such tool existed. So we had to make those tools. And, uh, and so we did, as a company, we put together a couple of different robots. This was the first uh, the first fur hat, this is Gen 1. Uh, it's beautiful, I know. And then this is the one you see over there, uh, tying into Jacob's sort of hardware as hard thing. Uh, that robot did break on the way here today, so uh, it's, it's cute to look at, I guess, will be the, the mantra here today. Um, but like Jacob mentioned, a lot of what we needed in the, uh, in the scientific domain, specifically doing research, was repeatability, right? So the interactions have to be the same every time. 
And we put together an SDK that afforded us that, right? You could get the same interaction every single time. Uh, and it's fantastic. The big downside of that and where it gets hard is that the world does not operate that way in, in, in real life, right? When your dog, when you throw the ball and the dog goes and gets it, the dog doesn't take the same path back every time. The dog goes where the dog wants. The dog brings the ball back. The dog might bring three balls back, right? You just never know. Um, and so the variation becomes really key to having natural, real-world interactions. Uh, and that's sort of where the large language model thing has actually made a big difference for us. Um, in the old days, if you wanted to code an interesting interaction, you went through something like this. You had to think of every corner case. You had to think of every if-then-else statement, right? You'd go through these giant screen flows, um, and it sucked, right? It's a lot of coding. It's a lot of manual work to create that. No one wants to do it. Um, but it's necessary to get to an interaction that has some amount of lifelikeness to, right? That's something that's interesting. Um, that became the way we just did it. Um, and you wind up on what's called the content treadmill. And the content treadmill is this dreadful place where you have to churn out new content constantly to keep up with the demand to consume the content. Uh, so we thought, can we approach the problem a little differently? And that's what we did today. Um, you know, we looked at what we do really well at, at Fur Hut Robotics, right? Our thing we do is, is social interaction, right? We know communication, so we know how to speak, we know how to hear, um, and we know how to pick up some of those social cues, and that's part of what we built into the product. Um, you know, we know about attention, uh, and that one's a little creepy, but the idea here is we're tracking gaze, right? We want to know where a person's looking because it's important in an interaction. And then we know expressivity, right? All of these, you can look at them and, and fairly well understand what each person or what this person is feeling in each, in each frame. So we stepped back and thought, let's, let's just see what we can do to work with these things and focus less on that content piece, or a little less on that flow. So uh, we focused on how you sort of describe the meta of the interaction, right? What does that look like? Why does it look like that? And less about designing the content. And what this is going to get into here in a second is just prompt engineering, um, which we're probably all familiar with at this point. Um, it's a big groaner, but we are leveraging chat GPT extensively. Right? It's, uh, it does a fantastic job, specifically in terms of latency. Um, there's not a whole lot that's quite as fast as that. So we're using it extensively to try and, and uh, help generate content right? when the content was otherwise hard to get. Similarly, you wind up in the same place where you wind up with patterns and templates, the same way you do in programming. right? You find that an adapter pattern or factory pattern become these common tools you go to all the time because they're the way you create standards in the outputs you create. Prompting ends up doing the same thing. If you talk about telling a story in the third person as an example, it's a great way to, to, show how, um, to show how content could be created in a repeatable way, but with enough variation to where you don't have to code the whole thing yourself. Um, we're using sentiment analysis pretty extensively as well to try and understand the tone of the message and to understand exactly what the robot needs to understand from the conversation. So when we go through these dialogues with the robot, the idea is there's a, a two-party exchange and we need to understand what the feeling of the user is and what the feeling of the robot is in response to the user. So there's an extensive amount of sentiment analysis that goes on in the back end. Sometimes that's done in, in GPT, sometimes that's done in a statistical model for doing that. It, it depends on the kind of text you're analyzing, but we do it all on text currently. And then we take time to model the things that we're good at, right? So those output variations, those, uh, those emotional classifications, how you deal with attention in the room, those are the places we're spending our time to say, you know, what we're focused on, you know, what output expressivity, what modalities does the robot have, a little less on what content is the robot saying, right? It, doesn't, it isn't about the content itself and the speech. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything is working. Not even close. Right. Well, we've got the variation, the variation we needed, right? We needed the, the, the interactions to come with a, a varied uh, array of outputs. Um, what we still have are things that just don't work, like hallucinations and LLMs are a common problem, and they're not really well resolved. If you make a storytelling robot, it's fine. You know, lean into it. Uh, in cases where you need the robot to be a lawyer, uh, it's, it might be a pretty bad lawyer. Uh, the appropriateness of the content, we haven't solved that either, right? The robot can sometimes say things that are just totally inappropriate or wrong. It happens, uh, and we're still dealing with that. And we're not going to invent those guardrails, right? There's, there's people in the industry who are going to do that. Uh, we're really consumers at that level. Um, there's a lot of built-in barriers. You've all heard it say, as a large language model, I don't have an opinion on that, right? Uh, you know, you have to work around some of these kinds of things, and they're built in by the developers on purpose. Um, 
one of the harder ones for us actually right now is keeping up with the developments. You know, I think Dan mentioned this earlier, things are moving so fast in this industry that I can't even take Falcon off the shelf and play with it, right? I don't have time. Uh, it's a huge deal, right? There's just no way for us to keep up with all of the developments. There's not enough staff to do it. So as we go through and see how the robot interacts with people and how it, uh, you know, it interacts on speech content, how it creates new unique content in these conversations, um, we're really just not even scratching the surface. There's just not enough people to do all the work. There's not enough time to do all the testing. And that's really where we are today. Um, we're at that moment where we would have showed off the robot and we would have gone through like a fancy demo. Uh, <laughs> however, the robot didn't, uh, didn't make the trip successfully today. So I think Jacob has a video. Is that right? No, that went away. That's all I had actually then, since the video didn't make it either, the robot didn't make it. Uh, we can probably talk about it after the fact or answer questions. <laughs>